Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the final session of the day. OK, so today I'll be telling you about learning with conjugate states and quantum memory. So um, I'm sort of going to tell you the punchline in the first slide, and then we'll see how uh, this situation arises. So what is the punchline? The punchline is there'll be a learning task defined on some unknown quantum state, which will come from an experiment or maybe a, a, a quantum simulation in a computer. And um, there'll be some well-defined learning task where if I'm allowed access to entangled measurements on the unknown state tensored with its complex conjugate state. So this is a state where I just complex conjugate every entry of the density matrix. So it's a well-defined quantum state. Then I can achieve this task with logarithmically many samples. However, if I don't have the complex conjugate state, even if I'm allowed entangled measurements on many copies of the original state, still the sample complexity is exponential, exponentially worse. So um, you know, this was a surprise to us that there is a, such a task where this holds. And uh, I think it shows how sort of rich and you know, complicated the landscape of these learning tasks and resources are. So we're trying to sort of, um, I'll try to convince you that this complex conjugate state is really like a new quantum resource that you can use in learning. And uh, which brings me on to my next slide. Again, before sort of starting with defining what our task is, what, like, how do we get this complex conjugate state? And um, the bottom point, so in general, it's not possible. So you, you should really think of it as a sort of resource that isn't always available. But sometimes it would be. What is two situations? Um, so I, I guess I'm going from bottom to top here. So time reversal, uh, certain systems, if I sort of negate the Hamiltonian and reverse backwards in time, then I can prepare the complex conjugate state um, for certain systems. So you know, that's the sort of capability that would allow you to get this complex conjugate state. Alternatively, if I'm preparing my state that I'm interested in with a quantum algorithm on a quantum computer, then it's a simple matter of complex conjugating every gate in the circuit, and this will generate the complex conjugate um, final state. So you know, if, if I'm using a quantum algorithm, then it's, I have this resource available to me always. So um, you know. But yeah, in some in, in some certain experimental platforms, it won't be it won't be possible. Okay, so with that, let's uh, start the the real talk. So we'll start with uh, an outline of what is what is shadow tomography. Shadow tomography is a task of this form, and by the way, I, sh I always have to sort of remind people that it's not the same thing as classical shadows. So classical shadows is a particular algorithm to solve shadow tomography, but shadow tomography itself is not an algorithm; it's a task. So Given copies of an unknown quantum state, we have a list of expectation values that we would like to learn. And we want each of them to precision epsilon. Um, and the question is, how many copies of a quantum state do we need to consume in order to achieve this task? So you can think of these quantum states as an expensive thing. Maybe you need a quantum algorithm to prepare it. Or you, know, you need to perform some experiment to prepare a single copy. So we'd like to minimize the number of copies that we need. And uh, this sort of is an abstraction of a lot of tasks that people commonly face in, in, in uh, experimental physics and quantum chemistry and all of these sort of different areas. OK, so this is just in words the same thing that was on the previous slide. This is the task of shadow tomography. Um, we can point out a few sort of trivial ways to perform this. So one would be to measure one observable at a time, right? I have my first observable, second, third. And each one, I need 1 over epsilon squared many samples to get to precision epsilon. So this gives me a sort of m over epsilon squared scaling, so linear in the number of observables. However, um, you know this is not great if m is very large. If the observables commute, then we can do this with log m over epsilon squared samples. Why is that? I have a very brief slide on this. So we can just measure in the simultaneous eigenbasis. And then uh, I guess intuitively this will make sense to everyone that you know you get information about all of these observables at the same time, but um, you know formally you can just use the empirical estimates and the turnoff bound gives you this sort of guarantee. Okay. Somewhat miraculously, Scott Aronson showed where he, when he introduced this task that you can always get this log m scaling. 
which is you know extremely surprising when you first see it and uh, counterintuitive, but um, you know he has some heroic sort of protocol that, that achieves this. There's two main caveats as to why this doesn't solve everything, and the two caveats are that it's explicitly exponential time, and the second caveat is that um, to perform Aronson's protocol, you uh, need to entangle all of your copies of the quantum state and perform joint measurements on everything. So you can imagine why sort of uh, even in fault tolerant quantum computers, this would be too much to handle because say if my sort of system is 100 qubits and uh, what epsilon is like 0 0.001 or something, then 100 over epsilon squared is, is a lot of qubits, logical qubits that you need to sort of do this. So, you know, for these two reasons, this is more of a features as an information theoretic um, proof that it's possible to get this log m scaling in general, rather than something that actually will be run. OK. And I should also mention, I don't have a slide on this, but um, classical shadows is another thing which sort of attacks this problem. And uh, that only works when the observables are either local or low rank. So it, it sort of doesn't work in general. Um, OK. So as a sort of e leading example, we can ask what happens with the shadow tomography task if I want to estimate all of the Pallys on my unknown quantum state. OK, so we sort of face this dilemma because these Pallys are not commuting. So there's no sort of uh, nice basis that I can choose that sort of tells me about all of like many, many Pallys at the same time. And in fact, you can sort of formalize this intuition. And in 2021, they showed that um, you know, if, I have, if I measure one copy of the state at a time, in fact, I need exponentially many samples in order to perform this task. Even just information theoretically, this is this was shown. However, it turns out that you can um, overcome this um, obstacle by using entangled measurements. So the insight here is that you know, if I have a Pauli p, it might anti-commute with the Pauli p prime, but p tensor p always commutes with p prime tensor p prime, right? Like x tensor x always commutes with z tensor z. So there's some simultaneous eigenbasis on two registers of all of the p tensor p. It turns out this is the Bell basis. So if I measure rho tensor rho in the Bell basis, I can simultaneously estimate all of these trace of p tensor p times rho tensor rho, which is equal to trace p rho squared. So by just entangling two copies, I can get information about all of, I can square root this and get trace of p rho, but I lose the um, sign information. But uh, you know, I can estimate the magnitude, at least, of all of these expectation values with log logarithmic scaling, right? Which would be log four to the n, so linear in n. Okay, so now I'll move on to talk about the displacement operators, which is the task um, the task of performing shadow tomography on the displacement operators. This is the thing where we see this exponential advantage from using the complex conjugate state. So what are the displacement operators? Here, um, we should imagine not being on a Hilbert space of n qubits, but rather on a Hilbert space, a d-dimensional Hilbert space, d to the d. But d, you should imagine, is very, very large. So d is exponential. For example, if I were to encode this Hilbert space on my quantum computer, then d would be equal to 2 to the n. So here, d is sort of growing exponentially. This is sort of my, the Hilbert space of my quantum system. Uh, again, I have an unknown quantum state. And how do I define these displacement operators? Well, I can define x and z as written here. So it's sort of a d-dimensional analog of the Pauli's. x sort of shifts you around the basis. And z is sort of like a clock, right? It sort of applies a phase according to where you are. And then in general, we can start multiplying x and z together. Uh, and this phase is just a convention to get these sort of d comma uh, d sub q comma p, and q is how many x's we apply and p is how many z's we apply. So um, one way to think about this is that there's sort of a discrete phase space um, parameterized by q and p, and d 
of Q and P is a unitary that shifts you in phase space by Q in position and P in momentum. Right? X is like a position shift and Z is like a momentum shift. Okay, so the task that we look at is to perform shadow tomography on these displacement operators. So we want trace of D times rho for all of these. I guess there are D squared many of these displacement operators. Uh, so these are unitary, so this will be a complex number in general, right? So, um, but you know, it's still a well-defined task to sort of estimate all of these. Okay, so now I will, um, I can share what are the results. So the first two theorems are both lower bounds and the third theorem is a new algorithm. So the first theorem says, this is just like analogous to the, to the Pauli case where um, if you measure one copy at a time, you need exponentially many samples. So the same thing holds here. If, if we measure one copy at a time, then we need uh, linear and D samples. So that's sort of, you know, not too surprising. Theorem two is the more surprising one. So even if I measure, you know, row tensor, row tensor, row many times, up to K times, where K can be sort of pretty large, it depends on epsilon, right? Then still the sample complexity is lower bounded by the square root of D. So remember D is some exponentially large thing. So this is still an exponential number of measurements that I need to make, even if I entangle many copies of this thing. However, if I'm allowed to measure rho tensor x complex conjugate, then suddenly I can perform this task using only log D samples. So exponentially better than the previous two. Okay, so how can this possibly hold? So first we'll look at this theorem three. How do we achieve this task using row tensor row star? And you know, hopefully this will sort of make the intuition clear as to why this can be a useful resource. Okay, so a little bit about these displacement operators. Um, they have some commutation relations where um, Remember, if I, if I braid two Paulis, I either get a plus sign or a minus sign, right? They either commute or anti-commute. These satisfy a similar thing, but when I braid them, I can pick up a dth root of unity, so a, a phase. And by the way, the thing that goes inside this is sort of called the symplectic product, if people have heard. And uh, so you can imagine these things in phase space. It's sort of D is like a sort of vector that shifts to you, a displacement. And uh, if I shift in that direction instead, that's sort of the transpose of the unitary. And then, you know, shifting the opposite direction is the inverse, as you'd expect. And then shifting down this way is the complex conjugate of the, of the unitary. So this is sort of a nice picture. And um, what you can realize by looking at this commutation relation is that, so it's no longer true that D tensor D always commutes with D prime tensor D prime, right? Because if I braid the first two and the second two, it's not true that, you know, before minus one squared was equal to plus one. But here I have a phase, which if I square it might not equal plus one. But if I use the transpose unitary, then it is true that D tensor its transpose commutes with D prime tensor D prime transpose. Because I braid the first two, I get the positive phase and then I get the complex conjugate phase when I braid the second two and those cancel and give me a commuting set. Right, so there's some, there's some basis which simultaneously diagonalizes all of these unitaries, D tensor its transpose. What is this basis? I can get there by applying this very simple circuit. So I do a, um, you know, I guess you should read this in reverse, right? I'm a, like, to prepare the basis going this way. So I do a quantum Fourier transform and then a controlled shift. So this is sort of the analog of how to get to the bell basis for two qubits, right? It's like a control shift and then a Hadamard. Okay, but then if I measure row tensor row like we did before, this sort of um, doesn't give me anything useful. It gives me trace of D times row times trace of D row star, if you sort of analyze it. But what if I measure row tensor row star in this basis, then I get trace of D row squared 
So, you know, this isn't a proof that it's impossible without Rostar, but this sort of tells you. And, and how it happened was we sort of found this algorithm, and then we were thinking, you know, oh, that's great, but I'm sure it's possible with row tensor row. So let's try and, you know, find a way to do it. But then we actually found a proof that it's impossible. So it was a bit of, it was a, bit of a surprise to us. So um, what is the proof sketch of these lower bounds? So um, you could define these E operators, which are sort of just permission versions of these displacement operators. And then you consider this collection of quantum states, rho, sub, q, p, and r. So this will be the identity matrix, so the maximum mixed state, but shifted by an epsilon amount in the E QP direction with an R as a sign here. So R can be plus or minus. And um, a task you can consider is distinguishing, so I either get a random one of these states or I get the maximum mixed state. And I can ask, can I distinguish these two scenarios? So certainly if I'm allowed, if, certainly if I can perform shadow tomography on these Ds, then I can perform this task because I can perform shadow tomography and if everything comes out zero, then I say I have the maximum mixed state. But if I see that one of the displacement operators has a high expectation value, that tells me which, which row I got from the ensemble. Um, but it turns out that you know, this distinguishing task is impossible using the restricted kinds of measurements that we saw on the previous theorems. So you can show that by saying that the, um, you know, even if I apply any combination of these measurements, remember they were sort of single copy measurements or measurements on row without the complex conjugate. No experiment, so L here is sort of the entire history of such a protocol, and it can even be an adaptive one. And, you know, you can show that the total variational distance on the maximum mixed state versus on a random one of these states doesn't differ enough to statistically distinguish the two. So that's how we show this. OK, so how does this fit into a bigger picture? OK, so the first thing is that these displacement operators don't come out of nowhere. They are um, sort of the natural operators that you see when you consider a discretization of a bosonic system. So, um, you know, if you imagine this Q and P being continuous, what we get is precisely a bosonic mode, like a, a single photon or et cetera. And uh, you can actually phrase this learning algorithm entirely in terms of optical sort of bosonic language, uh, which I had to learn. Um, I didn't know it before this project. So, you know, you can take row tensor row star and apply this uh, entangling Gaussian rotation. They call it a Gaussian rotation because it's e to the something quadratic. And then you perform measurements on the first register in the Q quadrature and the second one in the P quadrature. And these are called homodyne measurements. And uh, you probably know what this means better than I do. Um, and this sort of gives you outcomes which are entangled on the two copies. So you get sort of Q1 plus Q2 where Q is position and then P will be sort of a momentum entangled measurement. And we can sort of uh, perform the same task on um, a bosonic mode. And this is interesting because, for example, um, these displacement operators are important in GKP code states, right? These are the things that stabilize GKP code states. So maybe this could be an interesting sort of way to probe uh, these sort of interesting bosonic states. Um, a question for the audience, how can we formalize these lower bounds, right? These sort of D-dependent sample complexity lower bounds in the case of a continuous bosonic mode. I don't know how to do that. Okay. And I will, this is the final slide. Um, I'll just say that um, I think this is an exciting research area because what it really asks is what can I learn about a quantum state by exploiting quantum memory, right? So, you know, in a conventional sort of physics lab or experiment, I'll sort of get my quantum state somehow, I'll cool down a condensed matter system or I'll you know, perform some optical experiment and I'll get an entangled quantum state and then I have to measure it. 
right? I have to sort of, it hits the sensor and I measure in some basis. This is sort of the conventional way that physics is done. But if in the future we have quantum computers, you can imagine doing physics in a very different way. You can imagine A, sort of in the nearer term, you can imagine preparing an interesting quantum state with a digital quantum algorithm, right? In which case we can do this in parallel with multiple copies and then measure them together, right? Alternatively, even further in the future, we could imagine performing a physical experiment and then transducing the quantum state coherently into our quantum memory and then doing it again and waiting for the next copy and then measuring them in an entangled basis together. So that's the even further sort of future application. Um, so, you know, the question is, what can we do with these entangled measurements? And this is a new type of quantum advantage, right? This is uh, not in the same sort of paradigm of what problems can we get computational speed ups? It's a different type of advantage, right? It's an advantage of using quantum memory to do, to learn about unknown states. And uh, all of the sort of practical examples of this rely on this trick that we saw in this talk. So they rely on this trick where we um, sort of extend the Hilbert space by tensoring a, a different Hilbert space, and then we make the operators commute. And then we measure in their sort of new simultaneous eigenbasis. So, um, and then we managed to prove this theorem, which says that roughly this trick only works for things that look like displacement operators, which is what we tackled in this talk. So it's sort of the maximal application of this trick. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, for the audience, we should go out there and find new tricks that we can use to exploit quantum memory. And I don't know what they'll look like, um, but I think we need to go beyond this sort of the one that we used in this talk. Um, okay, I'll finish there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, so my question is about how you get uh, raw star. So um, yeah, there is a, a literature about how you can um, do uh, with a supermap, uh, transform a given unitary into a conjugate unitary. And there are results proven that you need to have basically order D number of uh, samples of, of that, such a unitary. And so my question is, have you considered uh, trying to analyze this question, but not for the whole set of unitaries, but maybe for some restricted subset or like a sub manifolds and, and things like this, which can um, lead to lower than D scaling, basically, like logarithmic in D scale. Yeah, I don't know, but I think in, in general, it's definitely true that it's impossible, right? I think you can probably, in fact, I mean, it must be, otherwise our, our theorems are not true. So, um, you know, it's impossible in general, but I would say a very interesting sort of very general case where you can construct the complex conjugate is if you have this, what Robin Cathari would call the uh, the source code, right? You have the circuit description of the unitary. So if you have the source code, then you can easily implement the complex conjugate unit. Thanks. Yes, thank you for the talk. So in theorem three, so it's this algorithm you, you, you gave, um, is it actually also known to be optimal, like in terms of sample complexity? Or can you maybe do something hope for something better even? Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, log D is optimal, but I don't know about this epsilon to the four. Now, where does that come from? That comes from the fact that what I'm really estimating is trace of D rho squared, right? So when I square root that, I would usually get, if I'm taking samples, like flipping a coin, right? I get an estimate of the bias with one over epsilon squared samples. But that becomes, when I do the square root, one over epsilon to the four. Now, I think it's um, you know, a very interesting question whether that is fundamental or whether that can be improved. So this epsilon to the four is sort of, uh, maybe could be, an, the only lower bound we have is epsilon squared, to my knowledge. Um, Right.
Right, but um, that's right. But also, interestingly, in the in Scott Aronson's shadow tomography, he had epsilon to the twelve or something crazy. Mm -hmm. But the best known shadow tomography is epsilon to the four. So, um, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for a nice talk. Yeah, in this slide, uh, maybe I missed something, but do you study like the regime where D is big, but you have like a less uh, number of observables? So like the number of observables in, in your- That's context. right. So I, I'm, I'm saying I want all of them. So there's D squared many, yeah. But c can you get like the number of observables or is it just like- Yes, yeah, D, D squared. No, no, if it's, oh. I have like K, uh, K observables much lesser than D squared. Like two, two or three observables. Like uh, well, if I pick a commuting set, then it's then it's quite easy. Um, for example, so it depends on the set. Okay. I, I was expecting like a log uh, minimum of uh, log d log uh, k the number of observables. No, I mean you can't show because if they're commuting, then. Yes. then... Um, thank you for the nice talk. So. Um... Uh, one of the premise that we are interested in um, calculating expectation values for polys is, well, they arise naturally in Hamiltonian simulation algorithms, or, well, you can decompose any operator into a poly basis. Um, so these displacement operators, do they arise in computational problems? Well, that's what I was saying at the end. They sort of correspond to uh, a natural set of operators on like a bosonic, on a discretization of a bosonic system. Okay. Um, so these displacement operators form a basis on the set of operators as well? That's right. Oh, okay, nice. Thanks for the talk. So I wonder if it would be possible to find an advantage similar to this, but in a task like doing tomography in fidelity distance or trace distance. Um, right, as in a conclusion like where you can exploit the complex conjugate state? Yes. Um, so I think uh, a friend of mine told me that measuring the overlap of a state with its complex conjugate is um, uh, something you can do very easily if you have the state and its complex conjugate, but is exponentially hard if you don't have the complex conjugate. So that's sort of a fidelity type task. But it was really sort of, um, we wanted to show for a natural sort of shadow tomography task that it's useful. But what I mean if, is if you can't think of exploiting this structure in doing tomography with respect to the trace distance, like the usual tomography. I see. I'm not sure if it would be helpful or not. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much. I uh, just wondered, in this case, for example, uh, this is still one boson, right? So it's not, uh, so it's basically something we could also imagine classically. You just have basically a P and the Q, right? So I don't think there is a lot of applications of this case as well. Is it correct? Or? Well, okay. I mean, one boson can be quite complicated because it's infinite dimensional. No, no, I know, so... but uh, just need to compute one integral, right? It's a very low dimension in my mind. You do not want exponentially many. I'm not sure. I'm just trying to to, to think yeah, about so, the so, application. So I think yeah. like this D sort of corresponds to how how much you discretize. That's so right. Sort of some sort of energy cutoff, right? Yeah. So like it's sort of like uh, if I have a harmonic oscillator yeah, yeah, or something, yeah, yeah. I'm going to more and more energy levels if I have a higher D. Um, and so I'm sort of resolving more and more higher frequencies in phase space. Maybe that's yeah, yeah, okay, about it. Yeah. makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe just another clarification. So you can compute the, the trace uh, squared with your trick. So is it correct you cannot get the sign or or the you, That's an interesting story. And we actually have a sort of uh, separate paper that's all about that. Um, and um, you you can, although there's a lot more caveats. It's not as nice. For example, sometimes it's not, we don't know how to do it computationally efficiently. So sometimes we only know how to do it if you spend exponential classical uh, pre-processing or, you know, Sometimes in certain situations we know how to do it, but the epsilon scaling is like really bad. So I think that's a really interesting question, and uh, we looked at it, but it's no, it's not, it's not solved by any means. But the short answer is yes, we can do it. Yeah. 